Appendix of Army Life in a Black Regiment. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by F. N. H. Army Life in a Black Regiment by Thomas Wentworth Higginson. Appendix A. Roster of Officers. First South Carolina Volunteers. Afterwards, 33rd United States Colored Troops. Colonels. T. W. Higginson. 51st Massachusetts, November 10, 1862, resigned. October 27, 1864. W. M. T. Bennett, 102nd USCT. December 18, 1864. Mustered out with regiment. Lieutenant Colonels. Liberty Billings, Civil Life, November 1, 1862. Dismissed by examining board, July 28, 1863. John D. Strong, promotion July 28, 1863, resigned August 15, 1864. Chas T. Trowbridge, promotion December 9, 1864, mustered out. Majors. John D. Strong, civil life October 21, 1862, Lieutenant Colonel July 28, 1863. Chas T. Trowbridge, promotion August 11, 1863, Lieutenant Colonel, December 9th, 1864. H.A. Whitney, promotion, December 9th, 1864, mustered out. Surgeons. Seth Rogers, Civil Life, December 2nd, 1862. Resigned December 21st, 1863. W.M.B. Crandall, 29th Connecticut, June 8th, 1864, mustered out. Assistant Surgeons. J.M. Hawks. Civil Life, October 20th, 1862. Surgeon, 3rd South Carolina Volunteers, October 29th, 1863. Thos T. Minor, 7th Connecticut, January 8th, 1863. Resigned November 21st, 1864. E.S. Stewart, Civil Life, September 4th, 1865. Mustered out. Chaplain. Jas H. Fowler, Civil Life, October 24th, 1862. Mustered out. Captains Chas T. Trowbridge, New York, Volunteer Engineers, October 13th, 1862 Major, August 11th, 1863 W. M. James, 100th Pennsylvania, October 13th, 1862 Mustered out W. J. Randolph, 100th Pennsylvania, October 13th, 1862 Resigned January 29th, 1864 H. A. Whitney 8th Maine, October 13th, 1862, Major, December 9th, 1864. Alex Heasley, 100th Pennsylvania, October 13th, 1862. Killed at Augusta, September 6th, 1865. George Dolly, 8th Maine, November 1st, 1862, resigned, October 30th, 1863. L.W. Metcalf, 8th Maine, November 11th, 1862. Mustered out. Jas H. Tonkin, New York Volunteer Engineers, November 17th, 1862. Resigned July 28th, 1863. Jas S. Rogers, 51st Massachusetts, December 6th, 1862. Resigned October 20th, 1863. J. H. Thibodeau, Promotion January 10th, 1863. Mustered out. George D. Walker, promotion, July 28, 1863, resigned September 1, 1864. W. M. H. Danlinson, promotion, July 28, 1863, Major, 128th USCT, May 1865, now the 1st Lieutenant, 40th U.S. Infantry. W. M. W. Sampson, promotion, November 5, 1863, mustered out. John M. Thompson, promotion November 7th, 1863, mustered out. Now First Lieutenant and Brevet Captain, 38th U.S. Infantry. ABR W. Jackson, promotion April 30th, 1864, resigned August 15th, 1865. Niles G. Parker, promotion February 1865, mustered out. Chaz W. Hooper, promotion September 1865. Mustered out. E. C. Merman. Promotion September 1865. Resigned December 4th, 1865. 
E. C. Robbins. Promotion, November 1st, 1865. Mustered out. N. S. White. Promotion, November 18th, 1865. Mustered out. First Lieutenants. G. W. Dewhurst, Adjutant. Civil Life, October 20th, 1862. Resigned August 31st, 1865. J. M. Bynerham, Quartermaster. Civil Life, October 20th, 1862. Died from effect of exhaustion on a military expedition, July 20th, 1863. G. M. Chamberlain, Quartermaster, 11th Massachusetts Battery, August 29th, 1863. Mustered out. G. O. D. Walker, New York Volunteer Engineers, October 13th, 1862. Captain, August 11th, 1863. W. H. Danlinson, 48th New York, October 13th, 1862. Captain, July 26th, 1863. J. H. Thibodeau, 8th Maine, October 13th, 1862. Captain, January 10th, 1863. Ephraim P. White, 8th Maine, November 14th, 1862. Resigned March 9th, 1864. Jas Pomeroy, 100th Pennsylvania, October 13th, 1862. Resigned February 9th, 1863. Jas F. Johnston, 100th Pennsylvania, October 13th, 1862. Resigned March 26th, 1863. Jesse Fisher, 48th New York, October 13th, 1862. Resigned January 26th, 1863. Chas I. Davis, 8th Maine, October 13th, 1862. Resigned February 28th, 1863. W. M. Stockdale, 8th Maine, October 13th, 1862, resigned May 2nd, 1863. Jas B. O'Neill, promotion January 10th, 1863, resigned May 2nd, 1863. W. W. Sampson, promotion January 10th, 1863, captain October 30th, 1863. J. M. Thompson, promotion January 22nd, 1863, captain October 30th, 1863. R. M. Gaston, promotion April 15, 1863. Killed at Coosfor Ferry, South Carolina, May 27, 1863. Jasby West, promotion February 28, 1863. Resigned January 14, 1865. N. G. Parker, promotion May 5, 1863. Captain February 1865. W. H. Hyde, promotion May 5th, 1863, resigned April 3rd, 1865. Henry A. Stone, 8th Maine, January 26th, 1863, resigned December 16th, 1864. J. A. Trowbridge, promotion August 11th, 1863, resigned November 29th, 1864. A. W. Jackson, promotion August 26th, 1863, captain. April 30th, 1864. Chaz E. Parker. Promotion, August 26th, 1863. Resigned November 29th, 1864. Chaz W. Hooper. Promotion, November 8th, 1863. Captain, September 1865. E. C. Merriam. Promotion, November 19th, 1863. Captain, September 1865. Henry A. Beach. Promotion April 30th, 1864. Resigned September 23rd, 1864. E.W. Robbins. Promotion April 30th, 1864. Captain. November 1st, 1865. Asa Child. Promotion September 1865. Mustered out. N.S. White. Promotion 1865. Captain. November 18th, 1865. F. S. Goodrich. Promotion October 1865. Mustered out. E. W. Hyde. Promotion October 27, 1865. Mustered out. Henry Wood. Promotion November 1865. Mustered out. Second Lieutenants. J. A. Trowbridge, New York Volunteer Engineers, October 13, 1862. First Lieutenant, August 11, 1863. Jas B. O'Neill, 1st U.S. Artillery, October 13th, 1862, 1st Lieutenant, January 10th, 1863. 
W. W. Sampson, 8th May, October 13th, 1862. 1st Lieutenant, January 10th, 1863. J. M. Thompson, 7th New Hampshire, October 13th, 1862. 1st Lieutenant, January 27th, 1863. R. M. Gaston, Hundreds, Pennsylvania, October 13th, 1862. 1st Lieutenant, April 15th, 1863. W. H. Hyde, 6th Connecticut, October 13th, 1862. First Lieutenant, May 5th, 1863. Jas B. West, 100th Pennsylvania, October 13th, 1862. First Lieutenant, February 28th, 1863. Harry C. West, 100th Pennsylvania, October 13th, 1862. Resigned November 4th, 1864. E. C. Merriam, 8th Maine, November 17th, 1862. First Lieutenant, November 19th, 1863. Chaz E. Parker, 8th Maine, November 17th, 1862. First Lieutenant, August 26th, 1863. C. W. Hooper, New York Volunteer Engineers, February 17th, 1863. First Lieutenant, April 15th, 1863. N. G. Parker, First Massachusetts Cavalry, March 1863. First Lieutenant, May 5th, 1863. A. H. Terrell, First Massachusetts Cavalry, March 6th, 1863. Resigned July 22nd, 1863. A. W. Jackson, 8th Maine, March 6th, 1863. First Lieutenant, August 26th, 1863. Henry A. Beach, 48th New York, April 5th, 1863. First Lieutenant, April 30th, 1864. E. W. Robbins, 8th Maine, April 5th, 1863, First Lieutenant, April 30th, 1864. A. B. Brown, Civil Life, April 17th, 1863, resigned November 27th, 1863. F. M. Gould, 3rd Rhode Island Battery, January 1st, 1863, resigned June 8th, 1864. As a child, 8th Maine, August 7th, 1863. First Lieutenant, September 1865. Jerome T. Fordman, 50 Second, Pennsylvania, August 30th, 1863. Killed at Wallahalla, South Carolina, August 26th, 1865. John W. Selvage, 48th New York, September 10th, 1863. First Lieutenant, 36th U.S. Connecticut, March 1865. Moran W. Saxton, Civil Life, November 19th, 1863. Captain, 128th U.S. Connecticut, June 25th, 1864. Noun 2nd Lieutenant, 38th U.S. Infantry. Nelson S. White, December 22nd, 1863. First Lieutenant, September 1865. E.D.W.W. Hyde, Civil Life, May 4th, 1864. First Lieutenant, October 27th, 1865. F. S. Goodrich, 115th New York, May 1864, 1st Lieutenant, October 1865. B. H. Manning, August 11th, 1864, Captain, 128th U.S. Connecticut, March 17th, 1865. R. M. Davis, 4th Massachusetts Cavalry, November 19th, 1864, Captain, 128th U.S. Connecticut, March 17th, 1865. Henry Wood, New York Volunteer Engineers, August 1865, 1st Lieutenant, November 1865. John M. Seacles, 1st New York Mounted Rifles, June 15, 1865, mustered out. Appendix B. The First Black Soldiers. It is well known that the first systematic attempt to organize colored troops during the War of the Rebellion was the so-called Hunter Regiment. The officer originally detailed to recruit for this purpose was Sergeant C.T. Trowbridge of the New York Volunteer Engineers, Colonel Serrell. His detail was dated May 7, 1862, S.O. 84, Department South. Enlistments came in very slowly, and no wonder. The white officers and soldiers were generally opposed to the experiment and filled the ears of the Negroes with the same tales which had been told them by their masters that the Yankees really meant to sell them to Cuba, and the like. The mildest threats 
were that they would be made to work without pay, which turned out to be the case, and that they would be put in the front rank in every battle. Nobody could assure them that they and their families would be freed by the government if they fought for it, since no such policy had been adopted. Nevertheless, they gradually enlisted, the most efficient recruiting officer being Sergeant William Bronson of Company A in my regiment, who always prided himself on this service, and used to sign himself by the very original title, Number 1, African Foundations, in commemoration of his deeds. By patience and tact, these obstacles would in time have been overcome. But before long, unfortunately, some of General Hunter's staff became impatient, and induced him to take the position that the blacks must enlist. Accordingly, squads of soldiers were sent to seize all able-bodied men of certain plantations, and bring them to the camp. The immediate consequence was a renewal of the old suspicion, ending in a widespread belief that they were to be sent to Cuba, as their masters had predicted. The ultimate result was a habit of distrust, discontent, and desertion, that it was almost impossible to surmount. All the men who knew anything about General Hunter believed in him, but they all knew that there were bad influences around him, and that the government had repudiated his promises. They had been kept four months in service, and then had been dismissed without pay. That having been the case, why should not the government equally repudiate General Saxton's promises, or mine? As a matter of fact, the government did repudiate these pledges for years, though we had its own written authority to give them. But that matter needs an appendix by itself. The Hunter Regiment remained in camp on Hilton Head Island until the beginning of August 1862, kept constantly under drill, but much demoralized by the desertion. It was then disbanded except one company, that company, under command of Sergeant Trowbridge, then acting as captain but not commissioned, was kept in service and was sent, August 5, 1862, to garrison St. Simon's Island on the coast of Georgia. On this island, made famous by Mrs. Kemble's description, there were then 500 coloured people and not a single white man. The black soldiers were sent down on the Bendy Ford, Captain Hallett. On arriving, Trowbridge was at once informed by Commodore Goldsborough, naval commander at that station, that there was a party of rebel guerrillas on the island, and was asked whether he would trust his soldiers in pursuit of them. Trowbridge gladly assented, and the Commodore added, If you should capture them, it will be a great thing for you. They accordingly went on shore, and found that the coloured men of the island had already undertaken the enterprise. Twenty-five of them had armed themselves under the command of one of their own number, whose name was John Brown. The second in command was Edward Gould, who was afterwards a corporal in my own regiment. The rebel party retreated before these men, and drew them into a swamp. There was but one path, and the negroes entered single file. The rebels lay behind a great log and fired upon them. John Brown, the leader, fell dead within six feet of the log, probably the first black man who fell under arms in the war. Several others were wounded, and the band of raw recruits retreated, as did also the rebels, in the opposite direction. This was the first armed encounter, so far as I know, between the rebels and their former slaves, and it is worth noticing that the attempt was a spontaneous thing and not accompanied by any white man. The men were not soldiers, nor in uniform, though some of them afterwards enlisted in Trowbridge's company. The father of this, John Brown, was afterwards a soldier in my regiment, and after his discharge for old age, was for a time my servant. Uncle York, as we called him, was a good specimen of a saint as ever I met, and was quite the equal of Mrs. Stowell's Uncle Tom. He was a fine-looking old man with dignified and courtly manners, and his grey head was a perfect benediction as he sat with us on the platform at our Sunday meetings. He fully believed to his dying day that the John Brown song related to his son and to him only. Trowbridge, after landing on the island, hunted the rebels all day with his coloured soldiers and a posse of sailors. In one place he found a creek and a canoe, with a tar kettle and a fire burning, and it was afterwards discovered that, at the very moment the guerrillas were hid in a dense palmetto thicket nearby, and so eluded pursuit. The rebel leader was one Miles Hazard, who had a plantation on the island, and the party escaped at last through the aid of his old slave Henry, who found them a boat. One of my sergeants, Clarence Kennan, 
who had not then escaped from slavery, was present when they reached the mainland, and he described them as being tattered and dirty from head to foot, and there are efforts to escape their pursuers. When the troops under my command occupied Jacksonville, Florida, in March of the following year, we found at the railroad station, packed for departure, a box of papers, some of them valuable. Among them was a letter from this very hazard to some friend, describing the perils of that adventure, and saying, If you wish to know hell before your time, go to St. Simon's, and be hunted ten days by niggers. I have heard Trowbridge say that not one of his men flinched, and they seemed to take delight in the pursuit, though the weather was very hot, and it was fearfully exhausting. This was early in August, and the company remained two months at St. Simon's, doing picket duty within hearing of the rebel drums, though not another scout ever ventured on the island to their knowledge. Every Saturday Trowbridge summoned the island people to drill with his soldiers, and they came in hordes, men, women, and children, in every imaginable garb, to the number of one hundred and fifty, or two hundred. His own men were poorly clothed, and hardly shod at all, and, as no new supply of uniform was provided, they grew more and more ragged. They got poor rations and no pay, but they kept up their spirits. Every week or so, some of them would go on scouting excursions to the mainland. One scout used to go regularly to his old mother's hut, and keep himself hid under her bed, while she collected for him all the latest news of rebel movements. This man never came back without bringing recruits with him. At last the news came that Major General Mitchell had come to relieve General Hunter, and that Brigadier General Saxton had gone north, and Trowbridge went to Hilton Head in some anxiety to see if he and his men were utterly forgotten. He prepared a report showing the services and claims of his men, and took it with him. This was early in October 1862. The first person he met was Brigadier General Saxton, who informed him that he had authority to organise 5,000 coloured troops, and that he, Trowbridge, should be senior captain of the 1st Regiment. This was accordingly done, and Company A of the 1st South Carolina could honestly claim to date its enlistment back to May 1862, although they never got pay for that period of their service, and their date of muster is November 1862. The above facts were written down from the narration of Lieutenant Colonel Trowbridge, who may justly claim to have been the first white officer to recruit and command colored troops in this war. He was constantly in command of them, from May 9th, 1862, to February 9th, 1866. Except the Louisiana soldiers, mentioned in the introduction, of whom no detailed reports have, I think, been published, my regiment was unquestionably the first mustered into the service of the United States, the first company mustered bearing date, November 7th, 1862, and the others following in quick succession. The second regiment, in order of muster, was the first Kansas colored, dating from January 13th, 1863. The first enlistment in the Kansas regiment goes back to August 6th, 1862, while the earliest technical date of enlistment in my regiment was October 19th, 1862, although, as was stated above, one company really dated its organization back to May 1862. My muster as colonel dates back to November 10th, 1862, several months earlier than that of any other of which I am aware among colored regiments, except that of Colonel Stafford, 1st Louisiana Native Guards, September 27th, 1862. Colonel Williams, of the 1st Kansas Colored, was mustered as Lieutenant Colonel on January the 13th, 1863, as Colonel March 8th, 1863. These dates I have, with the other facts relating to the regiment, from Colonel R. J. Hinton, the first officer detailed to recruit it. To sum up the above facts, my late regiment had unquestioned priority in the muster over all but the Louisiana regiments. It had priority over those in the actual organization and term of service of one company. On the other hand, the Kansas regiment had the priority in average date of enlistment, according to the muster rolls. The first detachment of the 2nd South Carolina Volunteers, Colonel Montgomery, went into camp at Port Royal Island February 23, 1863, numbering 120 men. I do not know the date of this muster. It was somewhat delayed, but was probably dated back to about that time. Recruiting for the 54th Massachusetts Colored began on February 9, 1863, and the first squad went into Camp Redville, Massachusetts, 
on February 21, 1863, numbering 25 men. Colonel Shaw's commission, and probably his muster, was dated April 17, 1863. Report of the Adjutant General of Massachusetts for 1863, page 896-899. to These were the earliest colored regiments, so far as I know. Appendix C. General Saxton's Instructions. The following are the instructions under which my regiment was raised. It will be seen how unequivocal were the provisions in respect to pay upon which so long and weary a contest was waged by our friends in Congress before fulfillment of the contract could be secured. War Department, Washington City, D.C., August 25th, 1862. General, your dispatch of the 16th has this moment been received. It is considered by the Department that the instructions given at the time of your appointment were sufficient to enable you to do what you have now requested authority for doing. But in order to place your authority beyond all doubt, you are hereby authorized and instructed. First, to organize in any convenient organization by squads, companies, battalions, regiments and brigades, or otherwise, colored persons of African descent for volunteer labors, to a number not exceeding 50,000, and muster them into the service of the United States for the term of the war, at a rate of compensation not exceeding five dollars per month for common laborers, and eight dollars per month for mechanical or skilled laborers, and assign them to the quartermaster's department, to do and perform such labor's duty as may be required during the present war, and to be subject to the rules and articles of war. Second, the laboring forces herein authorized shall under the order of the general-in-chief or of this department be detailed by the quartermaster general for laboring service with the armies of the united states and they shall be clothed and subsisted after enrollment in the same manner as any other person in the quartermaster's service third in view of the small force under your command and the inability of the government at the present time to increase it in order to guard the plantations and settlements occupied by the united states from invasion and protect the inhabitants thereof from captivity under murder by the enemy. You are also authorized to arm, uniform, equip, and receive into the service of the United States such number of volunteers of African descent as you may deem expedient, not exceeding 5,000, and may detail officers to instruct them in military drill, discipline, and duty, and to command them. The persons so received into the service and their officers to be entitled to and receive the same pay and rations as are allowed by law to volunteers in the service. Fourth, you will occupy, if possible, all the islands and plantations heretofore occupied by the government, and secure and harvest the crops, and cultivate and improve the plantations. Fifth, the population of African descent that cultivate the lands and perform the labor of the rebels constitute a large share of their military strength and enable the white masters to fill the rebel armies and wage a cruel and murderous war against the people of the northern states by reducing the laboring strength of the rebels their military power will be reduced you are therefore authorized by every means in your power to withdraw from the enemy their laboring force and population and to spare no effort consistent with civilized warfare to weaken harass and annoy them and to establish the authority of the government of the united states within your department sixth you may turn over to the navy any number of colored volunteers that may be required for the naval service seventh by recent act of congress all men and boys received into the service of the united states who may have been the slaves of rebel masters are with their wives mothers and children declared to be forever free you and all in your command will so treat and regard them. Yours truly, Edwin M. Stanton, Secretary of War, Brigadier General Saxton. Appendix D. The Struggle for Pay The story of the attempt to cut down the pay of the colored troops is too long, too complicated, and too humiliating to be here narrated. In the case of my regiment there stood on record the direct pledge of the War Department to General Saxton, that their pay should be the same as that of the whites. So clear was this, that our kind paymaster, Major W. J. Wood of the New Jersey, took upon himself the responsibility of paying the price agreed upon, for five months, till he was compelled by express orders to reduce it from thirteen dollars per month to ten dollars, and from that to seven dollars, the pay of quartermaster's men and day laborers. 
At the same time, the stoppages from the payrolls for the loss of all equipments and articles of clothing remained the same as for all other soldiers, so that it placed the men in the most painful and humiliating condition. Many of them had families to provide for, and between the actual distress, the sense of wrong, the taunts of those who had refused to enlist from the fear of being cheated, and the doubt how much further the cheat might be carried, the poor fellows were goaded to the utmost. In the 3rd South Carolina Regiment, Sergeant William Walker was shot by order of court-martial for leading his company to stack arms before their captain's tent on the avowed ground that they were released from duty by the refusal of the government to fulfill its share of the contract. The fear of such tragedies spread a cloud of solicitude over every camp of colored soldiers for more than a year, and the following series of letters will show through what wearisome labors the final triumph of justice was secured. In these labors the chief credit must be given to my admirable adjutant, Lieutenant G. W. Dewhurst. In the matter of bounty, justice is not yet obtained. There is a discrimination against those colored soldiers who were slaves on April 19, 1861. Every officer who through indolence or benevolent design claimed on his muster rolls that all his men had been free on that day, secured for them the bounty, while every officer who, like myself, obeyed orders and told the truth in each case, saw his men and their families suffer for it, as I have done. A bill to abolish this distinction was introduced by Mr. Wilson at the last session, but failed to pass the House. It is hoped that next winter may remove this last vestige of the weary contest. To show how persistently and for how long a period these claims had to be urged on Congress, I reprint such of my own printed letters on the subject as are now in my possession. There are one or two of which I have no copies. It was especially in the Senate that it was so difficult to get justice done, and our thanks will always be especial to Honorable Charles Sumner and Honorable Henry Wilson for their advocacy of our simple rights. The records of those sessions will show who advocated the fraud. To the editor of the New York Tribune. Sir, no one can overstate the intense anxiety with which the officers of colored regiments in this department are awaiting action from Congress in regard to arrears of pay of their men. It is not a matter of dollars and cents only. It is a question of common honesty, whether the United States government has sufficient integrity for the fulfillment of an explicit business contract. The public seems to suppose that all required justice will be done by the passage of a bill equalizing the pay of all soldiers for the future. But, so far as my own regiment is concerned, this is but half the question. My men have been nearly sixteen months in the service, and for them the immediate issue is the question of arrears. They understand the matter thoroughly. If the public do not, every one of them knows that he volunteered under an explicit written assurance from the War Department that he should have the pay of a white soldier. He knows that for five months the regiment received that pay, after which it was cut down from the promised thirteen dollars per month to ten dollars, for some reason to him inscrutable. He does not know, for I have not yet dared to tell the men, that the paymaster has been already reproved for, by the pay department for fulfilling even in part the pledges of the war department, that at the next payment the ten dollars are to be further reduced to seven, and that, to crown the whole, all the previous overpay is to be again deducted or stopped from the future wages, thus leaving them little more than a dollar a month for six months to come, unless Congress interfere. Yet so clear were the terms of the contract that Mr. Solicitor Whiting, having examined the original instructions from the War Department issued to Brigadier General Saxton, military governor, admits to me under date of December 4, 1863, that the faith of the government was thereby pledged to every officer and soldier enlisted under that call. He goes on to express the generous confidence that the pledge will be honorably fulfilled. I observe that everyone at the North seems to feel the same confidence, but that meanwhile the pledge is unfulfilled. Nothing is said in Congress about fulfilling it. I have not seen even a proposition in Congress to pay the colored soldiers from the date of enlistment that same pay with white soldiers and yet anything short of that is an unequivocal breach of the contract so far as this regiment is concerned. Meanwhile the land sales are beginning, and there is danger of every foot of land being sold from beneath my soldiers' feet because they have not the petty sum which government first promised and then refused to pay. The officer's pay comes promptly and fully enough, but this makes the position more embarrassing. 
for how are we to explain to the men the mystery that government can afford us a hundred or two dollars a month and yet must keep back six of their poor thirteen which was promised them does it not naturally suggest the most cruel suspicions in regard to us and yet nothing but their childlike faith in their officers and in that incarnate soul of honour general saxton has sustained their faith or kept them patient thus far there is nothing mean or mercenary about these men in general convince them that the government actually needs their money and they would serve it barefooted and on half rations and without a dollar for a time but unfortunately they see white soldiers beside them whom they know to be in no way their superiors for any military service receiving hundreds of dollars for re-enlisting for this impoverished government which can only pay seven dollars out of thirteen to its black regiments and they see on the other hand those coloured men who refuse to volunteer as soldiers and who have found more honest paymasters than the united states government now exulting in well-filled pockets and able to buy the little homesteads the soldiers need and to turn the soldiers families into the streets is this a school for self-sacrificing patriotism i should not thus speak urgently were it not becoming manifest that there is to be no promptness of action in congress even as regards the future pay of coloured soldiers and that there is a special danger of the whole matter of arrears going by default should it be so it will be a repudiation more ungenerous than any which jefferson davis advocated or sidney smith denounced it will sully with dishonour all the nobleness of this opening page of history and fix upon the north a brand of meanness worse than either southerner or englishman has yet dared to impute the mere delay in the fulfilment of this contract has already inflicted untold suffering has impaired discipline has relaxed loyalty and has begun to implant a feeling of sullen distrust in the very regiment whose early career solved the problem of the nation created a new army and made a peaceful emancipation possible t w higginson colonel commanding first south carolina volunteers beaufort s c january twenty second eighteen sixty four headquarters first south carolina volunteers beaufort s c sunday february fourteenth eighteen sixty four to the editor of the new york times may i venture to call your attention to the great and cruel injustice which is impending over the brave men of this regiment they have been in military service for over a year having volunteered every man without a cent of bounty on the written pledge of the war department that they should receive the same pay and rations with white soldiers this pledge is contained in the written instructions of brigadier general saxton military governor dated august twenty fifth eighteen sixty two mr solicitor whiting having examined these instructions admits to me that the faith of the government was thereby pledged to every officer and soldier under that call surely if this fact were understood every man in the nation would see that the government is degraded by using for a year the services of the brave soldiers and then repudiating the contract under which they enlisted this is what will be done should mr wilson's bill legalizing the back pay of the army be defeated we presume too much on the supposed ignorance of these men i have never yet found a man in my regiment so stupid as to not know when he was cheated if fraud proceeds from the government itself so much the worse for this strikes at the foundation of all rectitude all honour all obligation mr senator fessenden said in the debate on mr wilson's bill january fourth that the government was not bound by the unauthorized promises of irresponsible recruiting officers but is the government itself an irresponsible recruiting officer and if men have volunteered in good faith on the written assurances of the secretary of war is not congress bound in all decency either to fulfil those pledges or to disband the regiments mr senator doolittle argued in the same debate that white soldiers should receive higher pay than black ones because the families of the latter were often supported by government what an astounding statement of fact is this in the white regiments in which i was formerly an officer the massachusetts fifty first nine-tenths of the soldiers families in addition to the pay and bounties drew regularly their state aid among my black soldiers with half pay and not a bounty not a family receives any aid is there to be no limit no end to the injustice we heap upon this unfortunate people cannot even the fact of their being in arms for the nation liable to die any day in its defence secure them ordinary justice is the nation so poor and so utterly demoralized by its pauperism that after it has had the lives of these men it must turn round to filch six dollars of the monthly pay which the secretary of war promised to their widows 
It is even so, if the excuses of Mr. Fressenden and Mr. Doolittle are to be accepted by Congress and by the people. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, T. W. Higginson, Colonel Commanding 1st S.C. Volunteers. New Victories and Old Wrongs To the Editors of the Evening Post On the 2nd of July, at James Island, South Carolina, a battery was taken by three regiments under the following circumstances. The regiments were the 103rd New York, White, the 53rd United States, formerly South Carolina Volunteers, and the 55th Massachusetts, the two last being colored. They marched as one a.m. by the flank, in the above order, hoping to surprise the battery. As usual, the rebels were prepared for them, and opened upon them as they were deep in one of those almost impassable southern marshes. The 103rd New York, which had previously been in twenty battles, was thrown into confusion. The 33rd United States did better being behind. The 55th Massachusetts, being in the rear, did better still. All three formed in line when Colonel Hartwell, commanding the brigade, gave the order to retreat. The officer commanding the 55th Massachusetts, either misunderstanding the order or hearing it countermanded, ordered his regiment to charge. This order was at once repeated by Major Trowbridge, commanding the 33rd United States, and by the commander of the 103rd New York, so that the three regiments reached the fort in reversed order. The color-bearers of the 33rd United States and of the 55th Massachusetts had a race to be the first in, the latter winning. The 103rd New York entered the battery immediately after. These colored regiments are two of the five which were enlisted in South Carolina and Massachusetts under the written pledge of the War Department that they should have the same pay and allowances as white soldiers. That pledge has been deliberately broken by the War Department or by Congress or by both. Except as to the short period since New Year's Day, every one of those killed in action from these two colored regiments under a fire before which the veterans of twenty battles recoiled, died defrauded by the government of nearly one half his petty pay. Mr. Fessenden, who defeated in the Senate the bill for the fulfillment of the contract with these soldiers, is now Secretary of the Treasury. Was the economy of saving six dollars per man worth to the Treasury the ignominy of the repudiation? Mr. Stevens of Pennsylvania, on his triumphal return to his constituents, used to them this language. He had no doubt whatever as to the final result of the present contest between liberty and slavery. The only doubt he had was whether the nation had yet been satisfactorily chastised for their cruel oppression of a harmless and long-suffering race. Insomuch as it was Mr. Stevens himself who induced the House of Representatives, most unexpectedly to all, to defeat the Senate bill for the fulfillment of the national contract with these soldiers, I should think he had excellent reasons for the doubt. Very respectfully, T. W. Higginson, Colonel, 1st South Carolina Volunteers, now 33rd U.S., July 10, 1864. To the editor of the New York Tribune. No one can possibly be so weary of reading of the wrongs done by the government towards the colored soldiers as am I of writing about them. This is my only excuse for intruding upon your columns again. By an order of the War Department, dated 1st August 1864, it is at length ruled that colored soldiers shall be paid the full pay of soldiers from date of enlistment, provided they were free on April 19th, 1861, not otherwise, and this distinction is to be noted on the payrolls in other words, if one half of a company escaped from slavery on April 18, 1861, they are to be paid $13 per month and allowed $3 and half per month for clothing. If the other half were delayed two days, they receive $7 per month and are allowed $3 per month for precisely the same articles of clothing. If one of the former class is made first sergeant, U.S. pay is put up to $21 per month, but if he escaped two days later, his pay is estimated at seven dollars. It had not occurred to me that anything could make the payrolls of these regiments more complicated than at present, or the men more rationally discontented. I had not the ingenuity to imagine such an order, yet it is no doubt in accordance with the spirit, if not with the letter, of the final bill which was adopted by Congress under the lead of Mr. Taddeus Stevens. The ground taken by Mr. Stevens, apparently, was that the country might honorably save a few dollars by docking the promised pay of these colored soldiers whom the war had made free. But the government should have thought this through before it made a contract with these men and received their services. 
when the War Department instructed Brigadier General Saxton, August 25th, 1862, to raise five regiments of Negroes in South Carolina, it was known very well that the men so enlisted had only recently gained their freedom. But the instruction said, the persons so received into service, and their officers to be entitled to and receive the same pay and rations as those are allowed by law to volunteers in the service. Of this passage, Mr. Solicitor Whiting wrote to me, I have no hesitation in saying that the faith of the government was thereby pledged to every officer and soldier enlisted under that call. Where is that faith of the government now? The men who enlisted under the pledge were volunteers, every one. They did not get their freedom by enlisting. They had it all ready. They enlisted to serve the government, trusting to its honor. Now the nation turns upon them and says, Your part of the contract is fulfilled. We have had your services. If you can show that you had previously been free for a certain length of time, we will fulfill the other side of the contract. If not, we repudiate it. Help yourselves if you can. In other words, a freed man, since April 19, 1861, has no rights which a white man is bound to respect. He is incapable of making a contract. No man is bound by a contract made with him. Any employer, following the example of the United States government, may make with him a written agreement, receive his services, and then withhold the wages. He has no motive to honest industry or to honesty of any kind. He is virtually a slave and nothing else to the end of time. Under this order, the greater part of the Massachusetts colored regiments will get their pay at last and be able to take their wives and children out of the almshouses to which, as Governor Andrew informs us, the gracious charity of the nation has consigned so many. For so much I am grateful. But towards my regiment, which has been in service and under fire months before a northern colored soldier was recruited, the policy of repudiation has at last been officially adopted. There is no alternative to the officers of South Carolina regiments but to wait for another session of Congress, and meanwhile, if necessary, act as executioners for those soldiers who, like Sergeant Walker, refuse to fulfill their share of a contract where the government has openly repudiated the other share. If a year's discussion, however, has at length secured the arrears of pay for the northern colored regiments, possibly two years may secure it for the southern. T. W. Higginson, Colonel 1st South Carolina Volunteers, now 33rd U.S. August 12th, 1864 To the editor of the New York Tribune Sir, an impression seems to prevail in the newspapers that the lately published opinion of Attorney General Bates, dated in July last, at length secures justice to the colored soldiers in respect to arrears of pay. This impression is a mistake. That opinion does indeed show that there was never any excuse for refusing them justice, but it does not of itself secure justice to them. It logically covers the whole ground, and was doubtless intended to do so, but technically it can only apply to those soldiers who were free at the commencement of the war for it was only about these that the Attorney-General was officially consulted. Under this decision, the Northern Colored Regiments have already got their arrears of pay, and those few members of the Southern Regiments who were free on April 19, 1861. But in the South Carolina Regiments, this only increases the dissatisfaction among the remainder, who volunteered under the same pledge of full pay from the War Department, and who do not see how the question of their status at some antecedent period can affect an express contract. If in 1862 they were free enough to make a bargain with, they were certainly free enough to claim its fulfilment. The unfortunate decision of Mr. Solicitor Whiting, under which all our troubles arose, is indeed superseded by the reasoning of the Attorney General, but unhappily this does not remedy the evil which is already embodied in an act of Congress making the distinction between those who were and those who were not free on April 19, 1861. The question is whether those who were not free at the breaking out of the war are still to be defrauded, after the Attorney General has shown that there is no excuse for defrauding them. I call it defrauding because it is not a question of abstract justice, but of the fulfillment of an express contract. I have never met with a man, whatever might be his opinions as to the enlistment of colored soldiers, who did not admit that if they had volunteered under the direct pledge of full pay from the War Department, they were entitled to every cent of it. That these South Carolina regiments had such direct pledge is undoubted, for it still exists in writing, signed by the Secretary of War, and has never been disputed. 
it is therefore the plain duty of congress to repeal the law which discriminates between different classes of colored soldiers or at least to so modify it as to secure the fulfillment of the actual contracts until this is done the nation is still disgraced the few thousand dollars in question are nothing compared with the absolute wrong done and the discredit it has brought both here and in europe upon the national name t w higginson late colonel first south carolina volunteers now thirty third u s newport rhode island december eighth eighteen sixty four petition to the honorable senate and house of representatives of the united states in congress assembled the undersigned respectfully petitions for the repeal of so much of section four of the act of congress making appropriations for the army and approved july fourth eighteen sixty four as makes a distinction in respect to pay due between those colored soldiers who were free on or before april nineteenth eighteen sixty one and those who were not free until a later date or at least that there may be such legislation as to secure the fulfilment of the pledges of full pay from a date of enlistment made by direct authority of the war department to the colored soldiers of south carolina on the faith of which pledges they enlisted thomas wentworth higginson late colonel first south carolina volunteers now thirty third u s newport rhode island december ninth eighteen sixty four appendix e farewell address of lieutenant colonel trowbridge headquarters thirty third united states colored troops late first south carolina volunteers morris island south carolina february ninth eighteen sixty six general orders number one comrades the hour is at hand when we must separate forever and nothing can take from us the pride we feel when we look back upon the history of the first south carolina volunteers the first black regiment that ever bore arms in defense of freedom on the continent of america on the ninth day of may eighteen sixty two at which time there was nearly four millions of your race in bondage sanctioned by the laws of the land and protected by our flag on that day in the face of floods of prejudice that well-nigh deluged every avenue to manhood and true liberty you came forth to do battle for your country and your kindred for long and weary months without pay or even privilege of being recognized as soldiers you labored on only to be disbanded and sent to your homes without even a hope of reward and when our country necessitated by the deadly struggle with armed traitors finally granted you with opportunity again to come forth in defence of the nation's life the clarity with which you responded to the call gave abundant evidence of your readiness to strike a manly blow for the liberty of your race and from that little band of hopeful trusting and brave men who gathered at camp saxton on port royal island in the fall of eighteen sixty two amidst the terrible prejudices that then surrounded us has grown an army of a hundred and forty thousand black soldiers whose valour and heroism has won your race a name which will live as long as the undying pages of history shall endure and by whose efforts united with those of the white man armed rebellion has been conquered the millions of bondmen have been emancipated and the fundamental law of the land has been so altered as to remove forever the possibility of human slavery being re-established within the borders of redeemed america the flag of our fathers restored to its rightful significance now floats over every foot of our territory from maine to california and beholds only free men the prejudices which formerly existed against you are well nigh rooted out soldiers you have done your duty and acquitted yourselves like men who actuated by such ennobling motives could not fail and as the result of your fidelity and obedience you have won your freedom and oh how great the reward it seems fitting to me that the last hours of our existence as a regiment should be passed amidst the unmarked graves of your comrades at fort wagner near you rest the bones of colonel shaw buried by an enemy's hand in the same grave with his black soldiers who fell at his side where in future your children and children's children will come on pilgrimages to do homage to the ashes of those who fell in this glorious struggle the flag which was presented to us by rev george b Sheever and his congregation of new york city on the first of january eighteen sixty three the day when lincoln's immortal proclamation of freedom was given to the world and which you have borne so nobly through the war is now to be rolled up forever and deposited in our nation's capital and while there it shall rest with the battles in which you have participated inscribed upon its folds 
it will be a source of pride to us all to remember that it has never been disgraced by a cowardly faltering in the hour of danger or polluted by a traitor's touch now that you are to lay aside your arms and return to the peaceful avocations of life i abjure you by the associations and history of the past and the love you bear for your liberties to harbour no feelings of hatred towards your former masters but to seek in the paths of honesty virtue sobriety and industry and by willing obedience to the laws of the land to grow up to the full stature of american citizens the church the schoolhouse and the right forever to be free are now secured to you and every prospect before you is full of hope and encouragement the nation guarantees to you full protection and justice and will require from you in every return the respect for the laws and orderly deportment which will prove to every one your right to have all the privileges of free men to the officers of your regiment i would say your toils are ended your mission is fulfilled and we separate forever the fidelity patience and patriotism with which you have discharged your duties to your men and to your country entitle you to a far higher tribute than any words of thankfulness which i can give you from the bottom of my heart you will find your reward in the proud conviction that the cause for which you have battled so nobly has been crowned with abundant success officers and soldiers of the thirty-third united states colored troops once the first south carolina volunteers i bid you all farewell by order of lieutenant colonel c t trowbridge commanding regiment e w hyde lieutenant and acting adjutant End of appendix. Recording by FNH. Visit www.bookranger.co.uk.